Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We've been working our way through the Gospel of John and invite you to get a Bible if you have one and uh, follow along with us. Um, Let's just open up our time together with a word of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us to understand what you're saying to us. And I I pray, Lord, that you would just um, teach us by your Holy Spirit that we might apply what we learned tonight in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the title for tonight's Bible study is Jesus, the Son of God. And if you do have a Bible, you can turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. We're going to read verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As we begin tonight, it's helpful to remember that John wrote this gospel at the twilight of his life, sometime around 90 AD, and at a time when the Ephesian church was in real trouble. You see, teachers who were once part of the fellowship left the local church and began teaching a new message, one that challenged the authority of John, one that doubted the deity of Jesus, and one that challenged the necessity of one trusting in Jesus as Savior, where the idea of him being the Messiah, or even worse, the Son of God, which is what John and all the apostles taught, was absurd. And so John writes this gospel with a specific purpose in mind, and we see that purpose in John chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written, for what reason? So that you may believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so in his response to the crisis, John records a series of events designed to address this problem. He begins with uh, comparisons between the Jesus he knows and familiar Old Testament Hebrew themes which prove his identity. That in the beginning, the Word, who was with God, who was creating the world as God, took on flesh and dwelt among his people. That he, Jesus, was greater than Moses or the prophets, that he, Jesus, was the true bread or the true manna from heaven, that he, Jesus, was revealed in the Jewish festivals, all of which pointed to the truth of Jesus' claim that he was the Son of God. John's Gospel includes seven different miracles which once again point to the identity of Jesus. And his selection of these seven leaves no doubt about two things. Number one, that there were many other signs not mentioned. And number two, John purposely chose these seven for a distinct purpose. In other words, John's choice wasn't random, nor was it the first seven that came to mind. He chose these signs so that his readers would believe, that they would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The seven signs that John records are as follows. Number one, where Jesus turns water into wine. We find that in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The second sign he writes of is where Jesus heals an official's son. We find that in chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. The third sign is where Jesus heals a man who was lame for some 38 years. We're going to look at that story a little bit tonight. We find it in chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. The fourth sign is where Jesus feeds the multitude. We find that in chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Uh, Fifth, Jesus walks on the water. We find that in chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. 
The sixth sign is where Jesus heals the man born blind. We find that in chapter 9. And finally, John writes of where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. We find that story in chapter 11. Now, if you were with us last week, you might remember that we pulled five different words or five different groupings of words from verse 31 of John's 20th chapter. And the first word we pulled from the text was the word believe, so that you may believe, which means to be firmly persuaded, completely convinced, and absolutely certain of something. It's where we, without question, know what we believe to be true is, in fact, true. You see, to believe in Jesus, uh, the Son of God, is one of the core ideas in John's gospel. And his ultimate aim in writing is to call people to faith, is to call people to believe. Well, the second word we pulled from verse 31 is the word Christ, which, if you didn't know, is not Jesus' last name. It's his title. It means the anointed one. It means the long-expected one. It means the Redeemer whom the Jewish people believed was coming. It meant the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Savior of the world. And the point John makes here is to believe in Jesus is more than simply acknowledging his existence, that he was a great teacher, an incredible prophet, and a good man. To believe in Jesus is so much more than that. It's to trust in him. It's to rely on him. And it's to be fully confident in the fact that he loves us, that he forgives us, and that he saves us and that he gives us eternal life. This is the gift of God received by faith to all who believe. And we'll see this three, this theme excuse me, throughout tonight's study. Believe, and you'll receive life. But believing in Jesus doesn't stop there. John's encouragement to all who believe is that we continue to believe that we continue to trust and that we continue to rely on Jesus because he's always with us, because he'll never leave us alone and where he'll bring us safely home. And it's this kind of confidence, this kind of assurance that'll help us each and every day, even through the darkest days of our lives. Well, that brings us to our third word grouping in verse 31, the Son of God. Back to our text, John chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so John continues by declaring that not only was Jesus the anointed one of God, the Messiah, he was the eternal son of God. And this was something no one expected. I mean, the Jewish people were confident that a Messiah was coming. Some even believed a number of Messiahs were coming. But for God to send his own son, that was unthinkable. And John makes it clear that this, in fact, was the case. For God so loved the world that he sent who? He sent his own son. Now, being a Jew, John understand not only Old Testament Hebrew themes, which we've worked our way through, but he also understand, uh, understood excuse me, Hebrew law or Hebrew acceptable rules. And knowing the law or knowing the acceptable rules, John was quite aware that for something to be proven true beyond a doubt, two separate witnesses were required. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. It reads, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime, 
or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he or she has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So what this means is someone couldn't just make something up about someone and have that charge stick. It had to be proven by at least two eyewitnesses. And over time, this accepted rule went far beyond any criminal offense. In fact, if anyone brought up anything of substance, they'd always have a witness or two to prove whatever it was that they were trying to say. So what does John do? How, how does John begin his gospel? He begins it with the two required witnesses, and both will declare that Jesus is the Son of God. The first witness we'll read of is John the Baptist, and the second is Nathaniel. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Messiah. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. This is the eternal Son of God. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed or shown to Israel. Verse 32, and John bore witness. John was an eyewitness. In fact, he said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. I didn't know that he was the son of God at the time, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this Jesus, this Messiah is the son of God. John chapter 1, verse 43, our second witness. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Well, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, we have found the Messiah. Nathanael said to him, really? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, who in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how in the world do you know me? Jesus answered him, Be, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So John brings two witnesses to the forefront of his gospel right off. And after providing them, he continues by explaining the title the Son of God, and he does so using four individual stories. The first is the story of Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. The second is the story of Jesus healing the ungrateful invalid at the pool of Bethesda. The third is the story of Jesus teaching in the temple. And the fourth is where he raises Lazarus from the dead. We're going to work our way through all of these stories and just see where John writes, reveals that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. The first story is about Nicodemus. So Nicodemus, who was the teacher of Israel, begins a conversation with Jesus by acknowledging that he had to have come from God. Why? Because of the signs he did. They were indisputable. The signs that he did were 
obvious there was something unique about this teacher. Well, in the conversation, Jesus replies to Nicodemus with something that caught him completely off guard. Jesus gets right to the point of what Nicodemus did not understand. Unless one is born again, Jesus said, or unless one is born from above, he or she cannot or will not see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus has no idea what Jesus is talking about. He thinks he's speaking somehow of a physical birth, but Jesus explained that he was speaking of a spiritual birth, that it would take a spiritual birth for anyone to see the kingdom of God, for anyone to have eternal life. You see, this engagement between Jesus and Nicodemus teaches us that it's not the acknowledgement that Jesus exists that saves. It's not even acknowledging that he came from God that saves. Salvation comes by faith alone. It comes in or by believing in Jesus for the salvation of one's soul, where one is desperate, desperately needy for a savior. And that Jesus came as the son of God to redeem his people from their sin. Here's the story, John chapter three, verse one. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Who was Nicodemus? Well, he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a teacher. This man came to Jesus by night, and we can ask the question why that was, but we don't have time to discuss that right now. And nevertheless, he came by night and said to him, Rabbi, we, we rulers of the Jews, we teachers know that you are a teacher come from God. How do we know that? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And watch how Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot. He will not see the kingdom of God. Well, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus has no idea what Jesus is talking about. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this born again business is a spirit of God business. It's where God breathes life into someone and God washes that someone clean. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, Jesus said, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must, you must be born again. Verse nine, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you, you teachers, do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever, hears John's theme, believes in him, takes their assurance in him, trusts in him, may have what? Eternal life. And Jesus continues, for God, sent, uh, for God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. So there's this contrast between believing and non-believing. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
So that's our first story of Jesus being the son of God. In our second story, Jesus goes to a pool and strikes up a conversation with a lame man. Now keep in mind, this fellow had been an invalid for some 38 years. Imagine that. Yet when Jesus approaches him and asks whether he wants to be healed, the man's answer seems a bit strange. It indicates that he has no clue who Jesus is. You see, he, like many in that day, believed his healing lay in the power of the pool of water. There was this belief at the time that an angel would come from time to time and stir up the water and the first one in would be healed. Now notice the thanklessness of this fella as we work our way through this story. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, as you can imagine, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time, he he said to him, hey, do you want to be healed? Notice the man's response. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the water when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. Notice what he does. And he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, obviously he had walked away from Jesus, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. No rejoicing here. Condemnation. What are you doing? Walking around with your bed. But he answered them, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. The man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. Well, who healed you? Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was. He didn't even ask Jesus' name, nor did he thank him. Imagine, 38 years, crippled. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Verse 14. Apparently, this fellow wasn't looking for Jesus at all, but Jesus found him. It's interesting. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Hey, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Well, this is another opportunity for this fellow to thank Jesus for this healing. What does he do? The man went away and told on Jesus. The man went away and told the Jews, Hey, I know who healed me now. It was that guy over there. It was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. This is where he starts getting into some trouble. My father, Jesus said, is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Number one, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but number two, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. And so for John, Jesus wasn't simply sent by God as Nicodemus initially thought. He was God's son, making him equal with God, where he did God's work, where he was privy to God's plan, where he had God's power to give life, where he had God's authority, and where he was worthy of the honor 
do God. John's point is Jesus claims to be God and the Jews will hate him for it. Verse 19 of John chapter 5, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Here he is calling God his father, and this offends these fellows. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel, so that you may know. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he wills. The father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. I mean, listen to this conversation. That all may honor the son, just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, here it is again, has eternal life. Well, this conversation infuriates the leaders. They can't stand what Jesus is saying. So that's our second story of Jesus, the Son of God. Our next story takes place during the Feast of Dedication or the Festival of Lights. It's where John records Jesus' teaching that he and the Father are one. He's going to really get into trouble now. John chapter 10, verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, Okay, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, if you are the Messiah, if you are the anointed one of God, tell us. Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, there he goes again, bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And look at verse 30. I and the Father are one. Well, how do they respond to this? the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, they're infuriated. It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world you are blaspheming? Because I said I am the son of God. If I am not doing the works of the father, if I'm not doing the signs, then do not believe me. But if I do them, Even though you do not believe my words, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Our final story is set against the context of this situation where Jesus fled Jerusalem to avoid the Jews. But upon hearing of the death of his friend Lazarus, 
he and his disciples returned across the Jordan back to the village of Bethany, a suburb of Jerusalem, about two miles to the east. And once again, he is proclaimed to be the Son of God. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, what does he do? This illness does not lead to death. It is for what? The glory of God. This is going to be a sign that he'll perform, proving who he is. It is, a, it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he who sees the light of the world, because, excuse me, he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Listen, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. They have no interest in going back to this chaotic scene. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Okay, guys, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Believe what? Believe that he's the Son of God. But let us go to him, Jesus said. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Reluctantly, let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Now remember, uh, the Jews are out looking for him. They, they, wanna, they want him done away with. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So it was a crowd of mourners around. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to, and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Look, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said to him, to her, Martha, listen. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever, here it is again, believes in me, though he or she die, yet shall he or she live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Listen to what she believes. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. I am confident that you are the Christ, the Messiah. And she goes one step further and says, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, 
she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, hmm, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, hey, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed Martha, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen the sign that he did, believed in him. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these signs are written so that you may believe, believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. In his purpose statement, John wants his readers to know and understand that Jesus The Christ wasn't just a man. He wasn't just the Messiah. He is the Son of God. That he is the exact representation of the Father's heart, of the Father's priorities, of the Father's nature, of the Father's purpose, and of the Father's mission. That he came to accomplish God's plan and then return home. And so as we continue studying God's gospel, there can be no doubt that John, along with all the apostles, believed Jesus the Christ to be the very incarnation of God, that he wasn't just a teacher, that he wasn't just a prophet, that he wasn't just a good man, but he is and was and always will be the Son of God. The Son of God who came to give his life as a ransom to all who believe. And so John invites us to respond to Jesus, to this gospel message, by believing in him. By committing ourselves to him as our God. Trusting his death to pay for our sins. Where we follow him unreservedly. The result, John assures, will be life. Life in his name, which is what we're going to study again next week, Lord willing. So let's pray. So Lord, we thank you for your word, for this gospel that we read. Lord, I just thank you that you, through through these words, reveal to us who you are, what you have done, that you are the Messiah, the long-awaited one, but you are the Son of God, and that you came to pay the penalty for our sin, that we might have life in your name, that we might reside with you forever, that we might be drawn or 
brought close to God. I pray for each and every one who happens to be listening to this right now, Lord, that we would all surrender ourselves to you, knowing that we desperately need salvation. And it is you that we find uh, peace with God, uh, the saving of our soul, life abundantly, life eternally. So Lord, I honor you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll uh, we see you next week, uh, possibly Sunday morning or Wednesday night. Have a great week.